lisping, a desert land. It came in the hush to a world waiting as a shadow waits. It came as a flutter, a twilight bird, wings breaking the deepest waters, the cries of dreams. The size of souls. It came tender in the murmur of the newborn, in the ache of the swollen heart. It came as a whisper, soft on the lips of hillsides. It came in the song of the stars. It came as a rainfall. Great to see you this weekend, and we celebrate the very truth of that video talked about, the coming of Jesus. We're in the third week of our series, Advent, a season of preparation, and you may or may not be aware, but Advent is celebrated as a tradition by many followers of Jesus all around the world. Advent is a Latin word for the coming, and it refers to the reality that Jesus, as we expect and as we wait and we long for anticipation that he's going to come to be with us, it is a celebration of that fact as we enter into the Christmas season. And you can see over here, we've got kind of our traditional Advent celebration here, and we've been lighting a candle each week. The overall wreath around the candle symbolizes uh, this never-ending circle of God's love for us and his desire to come for us. Week one, we talked about the hope of Jesus, and we talked about the reality that he is the embodiment of hope for you and I. Week two, we talked about the peace that Jesus brings and the reality that he is the Prince of Peace and that he alone can help us to find peace in the midst of troubled times. And this weekend, we have the opportunity to celebrate joy as we talk about the reality of him, joy on earth or joy to all men that we'll talk about and how you and I can experience the fullness of joy through Jesus. The last week, we will talk about the love of God and ultimately light the Christ candle in the center Symbolic of him uh, coming to the earth for you and me and ultimately dying for us so that we could find purpose and hope in God. Well, as we talk about joy this week, and I hope you'll follow along with me in your notes, either online through version or through the paper ones you received when you came in today. But joy is a powerful word. And when we talk about joy, I think it's important when we associate it with the coming of Jesus to give a little bit of an explanation or understanding of what joy really is from a biblical perspective. Author and pastor John Piper said, when you look into scripture, you can begin to conclude that joy is the following. Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ both in the Bible, his word, and also in the world in which we live. Something that's unique about joy, and we're gonna be contrasting joy and happiness this weekend. Something that's unique about joy is that people who call themselves followers of Jesus should experience joy regardless of circumstances that happen around them. I remember when I was in Cuba, I ran into a man named Pastor Salvatore. He was a pastor on the uh, northeastern coast of Cuba. And because of Hurricane Harvey, his entire church was leveled to the ground, which was also his home, and there was nothing left. And one of the missionaries there who we support, we started talking with him, and he said that when he first encountered Pastor Salvatore, he asked him, he said, so how are you doing, brother? He comes to the site, there's nothing there. He goes, I am blessed by God. 
And he started talking about the wonderful things that God had done, even in the midst of an incredibly difficult circumstance that most of us would be brought to our knees by. There's something that's supposed to happen in us. You'll hear a little bit more about that story when we dive into our series in Philippians coming up soon called Joy for the Journey. But there's something powerful about joy and what it can do in us and through us as believers. But really, for most of our culture, they don't view joy that way. And honestly, from experience, I believe that most people think joy is simply another way to say happiness. I know for me, before I became a Christ follower, I didn't really even understand what joy was. I thought, you know, joy and happiness are the same thing. They're, you know, two sides of the same coin. And that the only time I heard joy more was during the Christmas season. And I thought that, you know, these things were hard to kind of grasp. They were based on just how you feel. They were kind of fleeting, hard to fully understand, which does make sense when it comes to the concept of happiness. Dr. Darren M. McMahon said these words, language reveals ancient definitions of happiness. It is a striking fact that in every Indo-European language, without exception, going all the way back to ancient Greek, the word for happiness is a cognate with the word for luck. Happiness literally was what happens to us, and that was ultimately, it's out of our hands. So essentially, happiness is based on the happenings we experience. So when we have a really good thing happen, we are happy. When we have a really bad thing take place, we are sad or discouraged or depressed. That's why happiness is so fleeting, because it's based simply on the circumstances that you and I experience. And I believe this is part of the reason why in America, especially during the Christmas season, there seems to be a lot of stress and overwhelming depression that takes place in our society. NBC News reported that some 45% of those polled said the holiday season brings so much financial pressure they would rather skip it altogether. Consumer Reports uh, listed the top 11 things that stress out people during Christmas season. Maybe you can relate. 68% said the crowds and long lines. How many guys experienced those this week? 37% said gaining weight. 37% said going into debt. 28% said having to go gift shopping. 25% said traveling. This next one's slightly funny. 24% seeing certain relatives. 23% seasonal music. Some people just don't like it. 19% disappointing gifts. 16% having to attend holiday parties or events that they did not want to go to. 15% having to be nice. That one just cracks me up. (laughs) Apparently they don't do that the rest of the year. 12% holiday tipping. Psychology Today said these words, according to the National Institute of Health, Christmas is a time of year that people experience a high incidence of depression. Hospitals and police force report higher incidences of suicide and attempted suicide. Psychiatrists and psychologists and other mental health professionals report a significant increase in patients complaining about depression. One North American survey reported that 45% of respondents dread the festive season. Why is this? I believe because the reality is we base it mainly on happiness. So when we have a difficult 365 days leading up to this season, we find ourselves discouraged or depressed. If we have a good 365 days leading up to this season, we find ourselves walking in more happiness. And it could even be, you say, well, it's not the last 365 days, Jason. It's been the last decade. Or it's been the last year, two years, or three years. And what happens is our emotions get intrinsically wrapped around what we've experienced over the last season of our journey. And I'm not trying to minimize in any way the hurts and pains that we go through. But what as I begin to wrestle with the scripture, I begin to think, what does this mean for me as a Jesus follower? What does this concept of joy really mean? How is it supposed to affect me? For me as a follower of Christ, it meant a complete reorientation on how I approach life, how I had chosen for the majority of my life before becoming a Christ follower, I focused on the pursuit of happiness. But the more that I read scripture, the more that I began to understand what he made me for, the more I began to wrestle with what I am supposed to do as a follower, the more I began to realize the fact that joy, not happiness, 
was supposed to be the normative experience for me as a follower of Christ. So where does this joy come from? And what do you and I need to do to focus on and to experience joy daily? I believe the Bible has some really powerful things to say about these questions. So would you turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 21. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 21. And I want to encourage you, if you're here with us and maybe you've yet to uh, follow Jesus and you're kind of exploring the claims of Christ, I want to encourage you this season to begin to do some research because Jesus historically was a real man who came to the earth full, fully God and man, and we have evidence of his existence, and I would encourage you to begin to pursue truth this Christmas season, and I believe as you hang out here long enough that you too will encounter Christ in a powerful way. As we dive into Luke chapter 2, we dive headfirst into the story of Christmas, and I want you to understand something powerful Before this story kind of takes place, there had been a season in the nation of Israel for over 400 years where there had been silence. There had been no major prophecies. There had been no major talk. The Maccabean revolution had taken place and revolt and had been quenched. And now the Roman Empire is fully entrenched in Israel. They're depressed. They're discouraged. They've got people that are taskmasters over them. And they're crying out and longing for redemption. Longing for hope, longing for purpose, wandering. And then on the scene comes the Messiah, the Savior that they had been waiting for. They were at a place of hopelessness, yet a place of anticipation. And I believe that even as a nation at times, we find ourselves in a similar place. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered This was the first registration when Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger." because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out of the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Verse 10, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace amongst those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. They went and proclaimed it. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. As we interact with this story, the question we ask ourselves is, what things do I need to focus on and remember so that I can experience the true joy that was promised? The very first thing, if you're taking notes, that I want to encourage you with is this. I must understand that I can have joy because Christmas is for me. I can have joy because Christmas is for me. Luke 2, 10 says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. You may or may not know this, but in the original language in Greek, the word great joy is the word megas. It's where we get the word mega. 
He's saying, I bring you tidings of great joy. It's going to be great. It's surpassing. It's surprising. It's large. It's outlandish joy. This is not a, a small endeavor, but I'm proclaiming to you great joy in the midst of all your struggle, great joy in the midst of your difficulty, great, outlandish, surprising, large joy. The next thing that I think is so powerful is that he says, that will be for some people, no. That will be for certain people, no. That will be for a certain ethnicity, no. That will be for a certain social standing, no. That will be for all people, all people, irregardless of their disposition, irregardless of what they've been through, for all people. I think a beautiful illustration of that are gifts. I know in my home, when I see gifts under the tree, uh, I like to go and see who they're for. This one is actually a gift uh, to me from my mom. And when I go under the tree and I pull that gift out, you know what I love to see? I love to see a present that has my name on it because it reminds me that somebody thought about me. It reminds me that I wasn't important enough for them to recognize the relationship we have and to provide it to me as a way of saying, I love you and I appreciate you. And during this season of the ultimate gift giving of Jesus, I also want to acknowledge that I value our relationship. I think that that's really what the angels are communicating here. It's a gift for all people. What does that mean? That God sees you. That, that he has a gift with your name on it called salvation, called hope, called deliverance that he was born for you, that he laid down his rights as God to come down both fully God and fully man in the form of an innocent child so that you and I could experience new life. He came to serve his creation. To live a life that honored the Father and then to die in your place and my place. It's the gospel, the good news. We're here God was here. There was a chasm caused by sin that separated us. God, knowing that, he sent his son, Jesus, fully God, fully man. He came. He lived a perfect life. He showed us how to love God. He was brutally murdered upon a cross. Then three days later, he rose from the dead, showing his power over sin and death and inviting you and I to enjoy this gift. If you'll enter into a relationship with me, he says, you too can experience the gift of grace, forgiveness, hope, and purpose. For all people. I love the fact that this great gift was given and it was first pronounced by lowly shepherds. People who were kind of not the greatest smelling, kind of probably not the greatest social skills. They work with sheep all day long out in a field. They weren't considered the upper class of the Israel system. No, these were individuals who were kind of on the fringes, yet God revealed the greatest gift to them first. It's powerful. And I want to encourage you and remind you, you may be here this, this weekend and say, you know, I don't believe that, that I'm good enough, that I'm smart enough, that I'm qualified enough, that, that I have enough for God to love me. And you know what? You're right. But he does it anyway. None of us are good enough. None of us have what it takes. But the beautiful thing is that he comes and he qualifies us. He comes and he makes us right. He comes and he allows us to be made right with him because he is the one that paid the price. He is the one that filled the gap. He is the one that made up for what we could not. So this Christmas season, we can celebrate Christmas because it is for me, it is for you. Jesus came to our home so that one day we could go home to be with him, our true home. So where does this joy come from? If you don't get anything else this weekend, this statement, please grab hold of it. Joy is found in Jesus alone. Joy is found in Jesus alone. Which leads us to the second thing that we need to focus on to experience joy, and that's this. I must embrace that my joy comes from my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. My joy comes from relationship with God. Luke 2, 10 through 11 says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Essentially, the Messiah, the Deliverer, the hope you've been waiting for, it's here. Joy is not found in what we have. It's not found in possessions or contained in accomplishments. No, joy is found in who we know, Jesus. The great theologian, Dr. Seuss, said it best in The Grinch That Stole Christmas. It came without gifts. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. It came through a personal relationship. And you say, well, can I just choose joy? Well, no, but kind of. You can choose to surrender yourself to Jesus and say, God, I may not have joy right now. I may not be walking in what you've called me to, but I surrender to you and to your will. I surrender to your purpose. Walk and move and, and work in me. And as we do that, the Holy Spirit of God fills us. He consumes us. In the midst of whatever we're facing, brings joy. How is joy different than happiness? Happiness is based on circumstances, on what happens around us. Joy is based on our intimacy with Jesus, what's happening on the inside of us that God provides. One comes and goes, that is happiness, but the other through Jesus is eternal and cannot be taken from us, and that is joy. Why? Because Jesus is the source of our joy. I think of a man like Paul. He wrote close to half of the New Testament. And what I love is one of these verses that he writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. He does while he's in prison, chained to a Roman guard. Bad food, bad environment, bad company, difficult circumstance. You want to know what he says? Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again rejoice. Joy is found in Jesus alone. Why? Because true joy is anchored in Christ's love, his willingness to meet with us. John 15, 11 says, These things I have spoken to you, Jesus speaking, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full or complete. James 1, 2 through 4, which is a frustrating scripture at times, says, Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Pierre de Chardin said, joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. That's why for you and I, we can have joy in the midst of difficulty because it comes from personal relationship with Christ. I think of a period of time about two years ago that was very difficult in my own life where Pastor John called me and told me he had cancer. Then three months later, I was diagnosed with degenerative disc disease in my lower back. Then three months later, my father-in-law died of a massive heart attack when my mother-in-law was in a coma and we didn't think she was gonna make it at the time either. And then some people that were very close to me began to walk away from their faith in Christ. And I thought for a moment, God, what are you doing? But you know what was amazing? Yes, my mother-in-law since recovered. Yes, John is now cancer-free. But in the midst of those difficulties, I found an inexpressible joy. Because it wasn't based on what was going on around me. It was based on what was going on inside of me through God. I think of when I visited uh, the nation of Swaziland, surrounded by Mozambique and South Africa, and I remember walking up these hills for miles, and we came to a spot, and we ran into four kids. The oldest was 12, and he was taking care of three others that were younger than him. Both of his parents had died from AIDS, and his caregiver was next door. We had just prayed with her. She was laying in a bed, and she was going to die any day from AIDS as well. Off by themselves, abandoned alone, but they had faith in Christ. As we provided some food for them, we talked with them. We tried to connect them with the church. You could see the joy in their face knowing and talking about how Jesus would provide. Our joy is not based in our circumstance. Our joy is based in the one that we serve. Joy is based not on the external, not based on what happens to us. It comes from something so much deeper within. Joy is found in Jesus alone. That's why I want to implore you. I want to challenge you this Christmas season. Take time to enjoy your relationship with Jesus. Don't get caught up in all the trappings. Take time to enjoy him. 
Take time to read and to memorize scripture. Take time to enjoy a good devotional. Take time to pray and to talk to him and to cry out to him because he hears you, because he loves you, because he has a purpose and a plan for your life. There's great technology we can use like version. There's like 100,000 Bible plans on there that you can go through during the year. There's things like great devotionals you can be a part of and, and apps where you can memorize scripture like verses. And I want to challenge you, enjoy that relationship. What else can I focus on? Well, thirdly, I can have joy because I can share the gift of Christmas. I can have joy because I can share the gift of Christmas. Luke 2, 10 through 17 and 18 says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Then verse 17, And when they saw it, speaking of the shepherds, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. You know what the term there for good news is? It means to proclaim or to speak out good things that are happening What's happening there? The shepherds heard the greatest news ever given to mankind and they began to proclaim it. So we can have joy this Christmas, not just because it's for us, not just because we can have a personal relationship with this loving God, but also because we can share this gift. We can receive it and we can give it away. And that should give us immense joy. Romans 1, 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. So will we believe that with boldness? This season, when we take those cards that were on our seat when we came in, and will we share with somebody? Will we invite somebody we work with or somebody we run into in our neighborhood, somebody we talk to at the grocery store? Will we share the good news? And that's not just inviting, that's talking about the story of what God's doing in our life. Sharing with them the simplicity of the gospel message that I just shared with you this morning. Because do we believe that people need joy? Do we believe that the Christmas message is real? If we do, we need to share. I think of a gentleman in my own family where I was sharing with him not too long ago and we were talking about God and he said, man, I just don't know if I can believe this God stuff. And I just said, you know what? I serve a living God. Give him a chance to show up. He said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take you up on that. And he was in a financial difficult situation, so he prayed. He said, all right, God, if you're real, will you show up and meet my need? I, Jesus, if you're, if you're real, will you just help me in this situation? Show me that you care. He was taking his dogs for a walk. He came back into the house after praying that prayer. His phone rang. It was his previous employer. He said, hey, I'm sorry. I've been, been negligent on paying you and taking care of you. I'm gonna give you more than I even needed to. And it covered the exact debt that he had. He called me up and said, Jason, Jesus is alive. He's real. I said, I know, I told you. <laughs> but will we step out in faith? Will we challenge people around us? and encourage them that we serve a living God who loves them, who has a purpose and plan for their life. Because we have to come to grips with reality that people who do not experience the goodness of relationship with Jesus will die and be eternally separated from God. So will we buy into that? Will we understand the hope that they need? Because if we do, we can walk in immense joy this Christmas season. Joy is found in Jesus alone. The fourth thing we have to be reminded of is this. I can have joy because my journey with Jesus does not end with death. 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9 says, Though you have not seen him, speaking of Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Jesus says these words in John 14, two through three, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Though one day all of our earthly bodies will die, the Bible clearly teaches us that we will live on forever in the perfect presence of Jesus if we enter into a relationship with him. And you know what's beautiful? We will experience joy for eternity. Nobody can take it from us. I love the words of C.S. Lewis on this truth about 
joy being found in Jesus alone. He says, joy is the enjoyment of God and the good things that come from his hand. If our newfound freedom in Christ is angel food cake, joy is the frosting. If the Bible gives us the wonderful words of life, joy supplies the music. If the way of heaven turns out to be an arduous steep climb, joy sets up the chairlift. So what's this week all about? Celebrating joy coming to earth in Jesus. And you and I this Christmas season have the opportunity. We're faced with a dilemma. Will we approach it like most of our culture in fanatic, running around, crazy, stressed out attitudes? Or will we embrace the true purpose of the season, Jesus? Will we choose to walk in intimate relationship with God, experiencing his joy that will forever change our experience? Can you imagine what would happen if all of us embraced the reality that joy is only found in Jesus alone? How would that change the amount of peace that we would have in the weeks to come? How would that affect the way we approach those that have yet to experience him? How would that change our focus away from simply the presence to being in his presence? How would that affect our future? Knowing that we're securely found in Christ and we can experience joy with him for eternity. Would you bow your heads all around the room with me this weekend?